If you would turn with me to Matthew 5, we'll begin in verse 13, and while you're finding Matthew 5, 13, let's go to the Lord together in prayer. One more time, Lord, yet again we come to you now asking you to bless our efforts to understand your mind, to understand our duty towards you, to understand what it means to obey you. Lord, I pray for hearts of brokenness and humility. I pray for hearts that desire to do nothing that is displeasing to you and do all that is pleasing to you. I pray that we would be malleable clay, soft in your hands to be formed into the image of Christ. I pray that we would be eager to be conformed to the image of your dear Son. I pray that the words that we read this morning from the very lips of Jesus himself would leave us awestruck with what it means to be a follower of Christ. Give us listening ears, active minds, and obedient hearts this morning, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Matthew five thirteen. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, to be trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and he gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. This morning I'm beginning a new mini-series in Matthew's Gospel that I'm just calling Authentic Christianity. Authentic Christianity is imperative for us because in our day, in our culture, the church, which is supposed to be the pillar and support of the truth, The church sometimes languishes and suffers and is spiritually malnourished, filled with people who really don't have an idea what it means to be an authentic believer in Christ. There's a variety of reasons for this languishing suffering of the church. One would be worldly shepherds. Worldly shepherds harm the church, and I don't just mean pastors who wear torn jeans and smoke a pipe after church. Pastors who try to influence people with how amazingly slick and youthful they are. I'm talking about elders who are incapable of using the Bible to guide the church. Incapable of using the Bible to guide church members. Elders who think that a church eldership is to be run like a corporate board of directors and have no idea how far off base they are. Pastors who embarrass themselves and the church out in the community because they're they're not godly men. Pastors who have homes that aren't really that distinct from the rest of the world. Shepherds who somehow believe that their own winsomeness and charm is the factor that's going to change lives instead of trusting in the surgical work of the Word of God used by the Spirit of God. Worldly shepherds hurt the church. The church also languishes under multiple generations of sentimentality. Generation after generation, it it used to be that the generation of sentimental Christians, those who believe that that going to church is somehow about an emotion, it used to be that they can point to their parents and say, yeah, they were in a different generation. Now, the sentimental generation's grandparents have been suckered into a seeker-sensitive, heretical model of what the church is to be. One of the greatest uphill battles the church faces is to convince believers that worship is actually about God and not about us. Many of you in coming to Grace Bible Church, you've had to experience a transformation in your own understanding that a worship gathering is not to induce emotion. It's not to give you an experience and certainly not to serve you and your felt needs that a worship gathering is commanded by God to give Him honor, to give Him praise, and to express to Him truths about Himself. The church languishes under 
and embarrassment at the biblical gospel. An embarrassment at the biblical gospel. The, the true gospel of Christ does not allow for a person to make a profession of faith, live his life in the church without ever actually being regenerate and to essentially be the same person he was prior to salvation. The true gospel doesn't allow for that. This is why Jesus warns in Matthew 7 of the religious frauds who will be judged. This is why Jesus explains that the, the tares will grow up with the wheat, that the church will have unbelievers infiltrating the ranks at times. And countless churches and pastors have attempted to soften the blow of the gospel by making salvation about finding God's purposes for your life or having enough faith to discover God's plan. Here's God's plan. It was to send you to hell unless you repent of your sin. And then the church languishes under the idea of the congregation as customer. The church member as the, the customer. and This is manifested in light preaching which offends no one. In taking polls about what would make church members happy. Trying to be as convenient as possible with Little bitty short worship services offered 57 different times a week to fit God into your all-important schedule. Comes across almost as apologizing for the existence of the church. We could spend all day listing the cancerous drains which cause the church to languish in spiritual weakness. Instead, the church is to build a culture of holiness and awe at our glorious God a love for the word, awestruck worship, the pursuit of God, the pursuit of, of righteousness. And this next section of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount really helps us get a grasp of this authentic Christianity. What Christianity is really about. Of what the life of a genuine believer really looks like. And in fact, what we have here in chapter 5 is, is the antidote to the hypocrisy which Jesus is going to expose in chapter 6. Those who do good things to selfishly be noticed by others. Those who give to the poor to be glorified by men. Those who pray in a way that's meant to impress people. Those who trumpet their spiritual actions to be noticed. And so chapter 5 is really a, a, an argument against the hypocrisy that Jesus is going to speak about in later parts of this sermon. And so over the coming weeks, our messages are going to highlight various actions that characterize a genuine believer, a genuine and authentic Christian. And I have to say that I, I guess I'm personally a little bit obsessed with this because the, the wheat and the tares growing up in the church bothers me and it's, and it's disturbing to know that no matter how hard the preacher tries, how hard the, the church tries to be effective that there will still be unbelievers who slip into the ranks and who worst of all fool themselves into believing that they're headed toward heaven when in fact they will stand before God and say did I not do this religious deed and that religious deed and Christ will say I never knew you and so by God's grace we will never shirk our duty from speaking about authentic faith genuine Christian faith. And so over the coming weeks, these actions will elevate, will, will highlight rather, elevate the Bible, discipline your mind, guard your heart, protect your marriage, show your integrity, suffer for now, love your enemies, give with humility. These are all hallmarks of somebody with genuine faith, somebody who is regenerate, someone who has come to an actual born again status before God. Actions that characterize the genuine, authentic believer. But for today, I'd like to focus on one action. I'd like to assert that the authentic Christian will light the world. That if you're a real Christian, you will light the world. A genuine Christian makes a difference. Now, by way of explanation here, verses 13 through 16 that I just read serves as kind of a transition. Beginning in verse 17, it would be, proper to call this section of the Sermon on the Mount really the core of Jesus' new covenant law. We talked about that when we introduced the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll do more of that next time. But he's giving the principles that govern the recipients of the new covenant, how we are to act, how we are to behave in the world. 
The new covenant will be inaugurated at the cross, but he's giving the law, new covenant law. But this transition here in verses 13 through 16 marks a, an interesting shift away from the Beatitudes. In the Beatitudes, you recall the final blessing, verse 10, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way that persecuted the prophets who were before you, what the shift here is that in verses 10 through 12, Jesus has explained that people will have a negative reaction to the righteousness of believers in Christ. The shift here is that beginning in verses 13 through 16, Jesus says, but some people will have a positive reaction. That's the shift. He steals us for the rejection of persecution. But then he says, there will be some who respond positively and let me tell you your duty in this. And implicit in verses 13 through 16 is a warning that salt that loses its saltiness and light, which is habitually hidden, may indicate a faith that was never real. It only had the appearance of godliness at first. We'll spend a little bit of time on that, but more directly for our purposes, it serves as a warning to us, and it serves as an admonition to us to live Christian, Christian lives that demonstrate holiness, set-apartness, that we are, we are different from the way the world does things. Here's a question for you. At the end of your life, will it have been noteworthy? Will your life have made a difference? Could a book be written about your life? Could a series of books be written about your life? Or would those who love you struggle to find enough material to write a reasonable obituary? Will your life be noteworthy? How do you light the world? How do you live a noteworthy Christian life? I'd like to suggest that our text this morning gives us a progression that the noteworthy life is indisputable, It's influential, and it's impactful. The noteworthy life is indisputable, influential, and impactful. And this is a progression. It's a sequence that that first, the observation of your life makes it indisputable that you're a Christian. The evidence is overwhelming. And then second, your life is noticeable enough to be influential. Others are now looking. They're not just noticing, but they're looking. And third, in the progression, not only are you influencing but you're downright impacting the world around you. You're you're changing lives. It may be your own children. It may be your workplace. It may be your family. You are changing lives for the better to the glory of God. So let's just walk through this progression together. The first part of this progression of a noteworthy Christian life, it is indisputable. Indisputable. Verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, to be trampled underfoot by men. Now, believe it or not, in the ancient Near East, salt was right up there with iron, gold, and wheat. It was very, very valuable. It had many practical uses. The most obvious one we know about is seasoning, to be seasoned with salt. It was used as a preservative for food, for certain crops and trees. Even It was used lightly as fertilizer even. Too much would ruin the soil, but a small amount for some crops was very useful. If you lived in ancient Egypt, salt was a symbol of luxury and wealth that you could, you could brag and boast that I have this much salt. I have a storehouse full of salt. In the Bible... Salt has a number of symbolic meanings as well. At times, salt is a symbol of death and destruction. It's a symbol of death and destruction. Lot's wife turned into a pillar, not of oregano, but of salt. Death, when she tried to go back to her home against God's orders in Genesis 19. The salted land in Deuteronomy 29 refers to having so much salt purposefully mixed into soil that it's impossible to grow anything. The barrenness of land. Job 39.6, Zephaniah 2.9, that salt refers to land that's just completely useless. Can't use it for anything. 
James 3.12 uses the contrast of fresh water to salt water to speak of blessing and cursing coming out of your mouth. So it can symbolize death and destruction. In a different fashion, salt also has covenant implications. It's symbolic of, of covenant promises. Certain offerings in Leviticus 2.13 were to be offered with salt. God calls the Mosaic Covenant, the Israelite Covenant, a covenant of salt in Numbers 18.19, a covenant of salt. He calls his covenant with David in 2 Chronicles 13.5 a covenant of salt. Why is that? Well, since salt is a preservative, a, a covenant of salt indicates a covenant that stays. There's loyalty to the one making the covenant, that you stick with it. In Ezra 4.14, those who chose to be loyal to the Persian king and opposed the work of the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem after the exile, they said that they are, quote, in the service of the palace of the king. But literally, we eat the salt of the palace. We're loyal. We're good Persian king followers. We eat the salt. And of course, in the Bible, Salt has the connotation of flavoring, flavoring for food. The Apostle Paul says, let your speech be seasoned with salt, flavored. That's so well known, I don't need to try to convince you of that. And there's one other major symbolic association with salt in the Bible, and that is of purity, of purity. And this purity includes The idea of new beginnings, of something brand new, of something being purified, changed. Ezekiel 16.4 speaks of rubbing salt on a newborn baby to cleanse and purify the child. In 2 Kings, Elisha treated a bad water supply with salt to remove the curse Joshua had placed on Jericho. So it symbolizes purity, new beginnings, something brand new. Now, given all those possibilities, the obvious question is, what connotation is Jesus using here in Matthew 5.13? Well, it's certainly not the implication of death and destruction. I think we can eliminate that option. The covenant implications, that might be explored as Jesus is giving the new covenant law. But he isn't really speaking of the nature of the covenant, but of the nature of the people in the covenant. He's not talking about the covenant, he's talking about the people. The most popular way to interpret verse 13, the most popular choice is, of course, that Jesus is speaking of salt as flavoring, that the life of the believer in Christ is to bring flavor to the world. Verse 13 even says, if the salt has become tasteless. So before we make a decision on what Jesus is getting at, we have to explore this idea of salt becoming tasteless. How can salt lose its saltiness? Table salt doesn't suddenly go bland. That doesn't happen. It doesn't suddenly lose its taste. Much of the salt used in Palestine in the time of Christ was harvested from the Dead Sea, but it contained impurities which had to be removed. Some of the impurities literally are, are, is the material that sheetrock is made out of. So imagine sprinkling sheetrock onto your salad or whatever. But a shrewd salt dealer might occasionally leave some of the impurities because you get a lot more product for a lot less work and effort and you would sell bad batches of salt. Still others were even more wicked about it and they would actually proactively mix cheap additives into the salt and sell it in large quantities. They would sell it in in large bags or in, in baskets and on the top layer, the top inch or so, maybe two inches if they're really smart, they would put pure the best salt and somebody would taste it oh this is good well you needed to dig down and find out the sheetrock is under there so we understand that if the cheap additives are put in the salt has lost its saltiness but i would argue that jesus is not speaking of salt as a seasoning or as a flavor let me give you a couple of reasons first of all the verb translated here has become tasteless is only translated this way one other time in the New Testament. Luke 14, 34, Jesus is giving a similar parallel teaching. But this particular word in all other ancient Greek literature is never translated to become tasteless. It's a word that means to become foolish, 
to become mentally unstable, to lose your mind, to cause something to be nonsensical, to be idiotic. And in fact, that same word is translated that way twice in the New Testament. Romans 1.22, professing to be wise, they became fools. Same word. 1 Corinthians 1.20, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish, same word, the wisdom of this world? In other words, salt that isn't salty is foolish. It's nonsensical. It's idiotic. It makes no sense. It's unstable. It's someone who's lost their mind, so to speak. So Jesus isn't talking about taste. That only leaves one option. That Jesus is speaking of the purifying value of salt. The new beginning value. The the purity value. You are the salt. The earth represents all the people around you. When Jesus says if the salt has become tasteless, he's speaking of losing its value, losing its effectiveness. It can't purify because itself is impure. Or to put it as we do in our circles... It is to lose your witness. It is to lose your testimony. Corrupt salt that's lost its ability to purify, it becomes worthless. And by the way, the the use of salt as a purifying agent is the most prevalent use in the Old Testament. Gives us another reason to believe that's what Jesus is getting at here. And you notice that Jesus asks, how will it be made salty again? In Jesus' day, there was no process for purifying contaminated salt. There was no way to do it. It was only good to be thrown out. In fact, it was actually, uh, impure salt was considered worth less than dirt and less than manure. You want to know why? Because dirt and manure can at least be used on the farm. But the contaminated salt is useless. You know what they used it for? They used it to pour on beaten paths like we do gravel today so that, you, so that nothing will grow there. And you could walk on the path. That's why it says to be trampled underfoot by men. This is speaking of the purifying influence of a Christian. There's two important applications I want to highlight. First of all, from this text, it seems that it's possible to permanently damage your Christian witness. It is possible to permanently damage your Christian witness. The ultimate hypocrisy, claiming to be in Christ while acting differently for a lifetime, acting differently than one who claims Christ, this may render your life utterly ineffective. Paul even warned of this in 1 Corinthians 3.15 when he gives the category of Christian whose life has been lived to such uselessness, such embarrassment to the gospel that he essentially goes to heaven as one naked, barely escaping from a house fire. Or if I could put it this way, a compromising Christian is no good to anyone. He embarrasses the church with his worldliness and frankly, he embarrasses the world with his hypocritical faith. Uh, The only person that the world hates more than a Christian is the hypocritical Christian. Because they see it. So it seems possible to permanently damage your Christian witness. The second application, having lost saltiness, as it were, it may be indicative of a false faith to begin with. It may be indicative of a false faith. Now, Jesus obviously cannot be speaking of a, a Christian losing his salvation. That's impossible. There is enough doubt to wonder if the person that started off salty was ever salty to begin with. In truth, Jesus warned in his parable of the soils that the seed of the gospel is planted in some hearts that, as he characterizes as rocky soil, that it springs up quickly and it seems to be thriving and it's so excited, but it dies away when the sun scorches it. I've been a pastor and a shepherd in the church long enough to have watched the rocky soil spring ups. Salt is the purifier is used by Jesus in a different context also, but I I think it will help us to see with a noteworthy life that's indisputable, without argument, what this looks like. And Just take a moment and turn with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, right near the end of the chapter. And we're going to see the idea of salt as purifying the believer and making his stand for Christ absolutely indisputable, without argument. 
Mark 9, right at the end of the chapter, verse 49. Actually, I'm going to start back in verse 43. 43, and if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire and where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast, in, having your two feet to be cast into hell and where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched for everyone will be salted with fire. Salted with fire. That's, that's a lot of metaphors crammed into a small space. What does it mean to be salted with fire? First thing we have to understand is that fire in verse 49 is used in a different way than it is in 43 and in 48. In verse 43, the unquenchable fire. Verse 48, the fire is not quenched. That is clearly speaking of punishment. But in verse 49, this is a different reference. This is a reference to sacrifice. Remember I mentioned Old Testament sacrifices seasoned with salt. Burnt offerings were required to maintain covenant fellowship with God and salt was a a sign of this covenant. I mentioned this in Numbers 18, 19 earlier. Ezra 6, 9, Israel was commanded to store up salt for the sacrifices, for the burnt offerings. Salt was a preservative and salt added to the burnt offering was a symbol of God's enduring, unending, preserving faithfulness. In fact, in verse 49, some Greek manuscripts of the New Testament add, probably in an effort to explain a difficult text, but some Greek manuscripts say, for everyone will be salted with fire and every sacrifice salted with salt. That's kind of a commentary, really. So we have a couple of ideas happening together here. At the same time, you have the idea of fire in reference to the fire of sacrifice, and you have the idea of salt in reference to the preserved nature of the sacrifice, the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness to covenant. Now, let me ask you a question. Where do we see the idea of sacrifice that endures and is faithful? We see this in Romans 12. Therefore, I exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living and holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. In other words, a true believer in Christ gets up on the altar as a sacrifice to God, and the fire comes But we're to be salted as the sacrifice. We stay on the altar. We stay faithful. We endure. We're salted, even in the fire. Jesus is showing that the cost of following him is total. It's complete. It involves sacrifice, shame, hardship, suffering. This is the attitude of total surrender to Christ, to be the slave of God. And that's the attitude that forms in someone that has an indisputably changed life, then no one has to guess that you're a Christian. What about the believer who doesn't want to be a sacrifice, who keeps trying to crawl off the altar, who maybe sees trials overly simplistically as God's anger instead of the character builder that they are, or who is half-hearted about pursuing Christ-likeness who's ho-hum in his walk with the Lord, who has no passion for God's glory, no passion for Christ, no zeal to worship God in holiness. Jesus addresses this in verse 50. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. Verses 43 through 48 that I read a moment ago, Jesus said, whatever keeps you from living a life pleasing to the Lord, cut it off. Anything that keeps you from pleasing the Lord, cut it off. Get rid of it. Why? Because the believer who has lost his saltiness is living a mixed life. A life that tries to mix 
godliness with sinfulness, a life that tries to be a Christian on Sundays only, that tries to mix worshiping God and and hanging on to my own idols, that tries to mix pursuing godliness sometimes and not even caring about godliness at other times, of times of deep commitment to the Lord and the rest of the time is just abject spiritual laziness. That's a mixed life. Now you might ask, isn't that my business? Why is it so imperative that your life as a Christian be indisputable? Turn back to Matthew 5.13 because we get the answer here. Remember in verses 10 through 12, Jesus explains that many will respond negatively to your faith in Christ. But here in verses 13 through 16, he's encouraging you that some will live, will respond positively. If, if, if you're living a life that is indisputably authentic. So why is it so important that your life as a Christian is indisputable? The Greek in verse 13 is repetitive, to be emphatic. We could say it like this, you and only you and no one else is the salt of the earth. Plural, you are the salt of the earth. Only Christians are salt. Only Christians. Only you possess the knowledge of the faith that can transform a person. There is no other message. And there are no other messengers. It's just you. Peter said in Acts 4.12, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other source of salt. It's only you. But if your life is so saltless, so mixed, so diluted, then you've lost your ability to help the cause of the kingdom. You're sidelined. You're benched. You're put on the shelf. You want to live a noteworthy Christian life? Make it indisputable that you are a Christian by the life that you lead. The next part of our progression to live a noteworthy life is first, it's indisputable. The second part is that your Christian life is influential. It's influential. It's not just noticed. It's now observed at a higher level. Verse 14 You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. You are the light of the world, and this is reflected light. This is borrowed light. Jesus said in John 8, John 9, and John 12, I am the light of the world. In fact, already in Matthew, Jesus is associated with light and Matthew 4, 16, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. Those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. So for you to be the light of the world is to reflect the light of Christ. It's borrowed light. It's not your own. By the way, the implication here is very clear, and that is that the world is steeped in darkness. And the world needs light. And that only the presence of Christians gives the spiritual light necessary for others to come to the light of Christ and And Jesus gives two illustrations here. They're very easy to understand. The first illustration, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You are, as a believer in Christ, like a city of hope. You're set on a hill by God where others can see you. By the way, where does this start? I would say officially it starts at your baptism. Because at your baptism, you are claiming to follow the light. You're claiming to be a reflector of the light. Even your baptism testimony is the act of being a a city set on a hill. The story of God's grace in your life acts as a beacon for others to follow. We have members of our own church that the final step toward becoming a Christian for them was hearing your testimony of salvation at your baptism. You were a beacon of light. You were the city on a hill. And he gives a second illustration an oil lamp which would be lit and put on a stand. And, and, and he says something that everyone listening would say is ridiculous. No, no one would light a lamp and then put it under a basket or a bowl. That makes no sense. Instead, the light is to shine. You as a believer are to be influential. Look at the end of verse 15. It gives light to all who are in the house. It influences. And you can't do that if your life is characterized by compromise. In fact, just by way of example, we could simply continue on the, 
in the Sermon on the Mount to test for a compromised life. Matthew 5, 21. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be guilty before the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the San, guilty before the court, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be guilty before the Sanhedrin, and whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. That if you harbor bitterness and anger toward others, it will show in your words, it will show in your behavior, that's a compromised life, and it's not influential. Why? Because even many unbelievers don't want anger to rule their lives. Verse 23, Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. That if a brother or sister in Christ is having issues with you at any level whatsoever, and that doesn't compel you to try to work it out, that's a compromised life. That's not influential. Why? Because even many unbelievers want to live in peace. And when they see Christians who can't, it's a total turnoff. How about verse 25? Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you're with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last quadrants. It's a unit of money. What is Jesus saying here? Make friends anytime you can. Pursue reconciliation if at all possible, especially if you know that you're in the wrong. Pursue reconciliation. Why? Because even unbelievers can simply resort to fighting each other in court and never resolving their differences. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. To guard your your hearts and even your eyes, to be men and women of integrity, men who don't cultivate thoughts of another woman and women who don't cultivate thoughts of another man. Why? Because even many unbelievers value fidelity and loyalty in a relationship. You get the point. We can go through the rest of the Sermon on the Mount and see the choice here. That you are to be influential. Even even if you feel like it's just you. In fact, the Apostle Paul gives us an example of when it's just you. It's so useful to us, I think it's worth turning there. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 7. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is addressing many concerns that newly converted Corinthians, they had concerning about their previous lives. Their previous lives were getting dragged into their Christian lives and one of the biggest sets of questions, one of the biggest concerns had to do with various issues around being married. Now, why is this a concern? Well, Paul is addressing what to do if you've come to faith in Christ but your spouse hasn't. That you now find yourself in an unequal situation. He says that if a spouse wants to leave or wants to treat you in a manner that says there is no more genuine marriage, then verse 15 allows a marriage to resolve, to dissolve. rather. But if there's a desire on the part of the unbeliever to remain married, not, not just to stay under the same roof and torture one another, but there's a genuine love between the two, then Paul gives a clear admonition, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 12. But to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not divorce her husband. Now let me explain this little side note here because this kind of makes people nervous. But to the rest I say, not the Lord. Wait a minute, is Paul going off the rails here? Is he, is he just speaking his opinion? No, he's speaking to a situation that didn't exist in the Old Testament. There is no scripture he could quote to say, here's what you do when you come to faith in the Messiah, but your spouse doesn't. That wasn't addressed in the Old Testament, so he's giving new revelation from the Lord. That's why he says that. There's a benefit. The reason, Paul says, if she consents to live with him or if he consents to live with the unbelieving wife or uh, unbelieving spouse... There's a benefit. 
that the Christian spouse, even as the only Christian in the home, the sole Christian has influence. And look at this. Verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise, your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Now, don't take this too far. This is not works-based salvation. This is not saying that the unbelieving spouse is now guaranteed salvation, nor does it say that unbelieving children are now guaranteed salvation. It says that they're sanctified, that they're made holy. In what sense? They're sanctified, they're set apart, made holy, in the sense that they are now privileged to gloriously be in daily and intimate communication and communion and relationship to live everyday life with someone in whom the Spirit of God dwells. In other words, the Holy Spirit has now taken up residence in that home because there's one Christian there. And what an influence the unbelieving spouse can be. And what a responsibility. You know, if you think it's important for husbands to love their wives as Christ loves the church between two Christians, we might make the case that it's even more vital in a mixed marriage because the life and testimony of the husband is perhaps a catalyst, the salt, the light for the wife to see the power of Christ. You think it's important for wives to submit to their husbands as unto the Lord between two Christians? It may be even more important in a mixed marriage. First Peter 3 gives the wife the strategy of winning her husband with her pure conduct, her lowly and quiet spirit, to demonstrate what the Spirit of God in a genuine believer looks like. The Christian who's pursuing an authentic Christian life should be and must be Influential. Otherwise, he's like a city that's been blacked out or a lamp that's covered up. It's ridiculous and less than useless. Turn back with me to Matthew chapter 5. You want to be influential by how you live your life? We could be spending many months on this because we're dealing with sanctified living, but let me identify some ways to be influential. And I'm kind of taking this from My observation as a pastor in some of the ways that Christians fail to be salt and light, but we'll turn them positive. Let me give you six ways to be influential. The first one is work as unto the Lord. Work as unto the Lord. Colossians 3.23 commands that you work heartily in whatever you do. Nothing says, I'm hiding my light under a basket like a lazy Christian who can't work, who can't put forth effort. This is singularly unimpressive and it's very offensive and it it means you can't say anything. Work as unto the Lord. It's the second way to be influential. Suffer like a Christian should. Suffer like a Christian should. Non-Christians do all kinds of things when they're suffering. They may, for example, go to counseling since counseling solves all problems apparently or so the counseling world tells us. They may panic. They may get angry. They may lash out at others. They they might even put on a brave front, but it can't be real because faith only comes from Christ. They may try to become very philosophical and try to achieve some sort of higher plane of wisdom that here's all the things I've learned through my suffering. They may shut down in complete depression. They may be consumed with anxiety to the point that they literally can't leave their houses. They may be completely, bitterly, unforgiving, totally justified in their own hearts and hateful towards someone who's hurt them. Uh, the, the, The list is endless of how unbelievers handle suffering. And so when a Christian handles suffering the same way the world does, it destroys your influence. You be different. Truly believe and extol the sovereignty of God. When somebody says, oh, I can't believe God did this. Oh, I can. God brings all suffering to me and I'm thankful for it. Because Lamentations 3.38 says that everything comes from the mouth of God, good and bad. And I accept that. I receive it. That will turn some heads. Or this, when you're suffering, practice peaceful acceptance of God's providence. But how can you live with this? Oh, I can live with this because God providentially brought this into my life and even if it gets worse oh but what if you die of this oh praise the lord i'll be home in heaven 
what if this person that you love so much continues to reject you? How can you possibly accept God? Because God is the author of all things over men's hearts, not me. Yes, suffering brings emotion, but the Christian is not ruled by emotion. You're ruled by truth. And when you vent your anger at something you're suffering at an unbeliever, you have just destroyed your ability to tell them how gloriously faithful God is. Don't let suffering be an excuse for sin. Don't let your suffering be an excuse to have a sinful tongue, sinful actions. And receive with gladness God's work in your life, which He designed specifically for your sanctification. James 1 says to consider it all what? Joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. You want to make an unbeliever stop in his tracks when he says, how, how can you deal with this? You say, God designed this for me. Um, just so you know, you're dying, right? Yes, God designed this for me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass this test. You see, God is sovereign and I trust him. And you're, you're taken to the gospel right then because their mouths are closed and a Christian who can handle suffering in a way the world cannot possibly comprehend. There's a third way to be influential. Be a pillar and foundation of the truth. Be a pillar and foundation of the truth. 1 Timothy 3.15 indicates that Christians are carriers of truth. We carry it. We, we're seeking to know God's word. And just by knowing God's word, you are being a light. You are being salt. Part of the reason we're doing our somewhat complex theological study on the millennium on Sunday evenings is to fulfill this mandate. It is to implant truth in you so that you know the truth and you know how truth is arrived at. And by doing so and by implanting truth in your own hearts, you are a pillar and a foundation. You are being salt. You are being light. I mentioned earlier, churches just beset by the cancer of sentimentality. You want to know why churches go down this road? Because they now have entire generations of Christians and entire church membership They can't even tell you the basics of the faith. They can't tell you what worship is. They can't tell you what the cross is really about. They have lost their status as being pillars and supports of the truth. They're not carriers of the truth anymore. Therefore, they're completely ineffective in the world. Here's a fourth way to be influential. Target your greatest sin tendency. Target your greatest sin tendency. If you don't know your greatest sin tendency, pray and the Lord will help you. And he'll help you by bringing people into your life that will tell you. I have a simple question. At what point is it okay with you to go to those closest to you and say, look, just lay it on the line. Just tell me what I need to do. Tell me how to be more like Christ. Accelerate this process. Let me put it to you this way. If you were about to climb into the cockpit of an airplane and a a, a flight instructor could tell you, here are the two things you keep doing every time you get in the cockpit that this time are going to kill you. What would you do? You would say, excuse me, let me get my pen. I will take notes on this and I will make changes right now. Decide that it's time to stop excusing sinful behavior and making excuses to those around you. Own it. Meditate on it memorize scripture about it, study scripture about it. For me, as your shepherd, this is one of my greatest prayers for you, and that is that you surrender, that you wave the white flag and you aggressively identify sin and beat it into submission. That we, as 21st century Christians, would go back in time to the days of the Puritans where they worked so hard to be Christ-like. And somebody says, well, that's legalism. No. Legalism is believing you can please God unto salvation by doing good things. Maturity in the faith is pleasing God by loving Him enough to obey Him. Jesus said, if you love me, you do what? Obey my commandments. Here's a fifth way that you can be influential humble yourself at every turn. Humble yourself at every turn. All of you have been out in the world enough to know that when you run into somebody who is genuinely humble, it's, it's refreshing and a little bit surprising, isn't it? 
when you go to uh, confront somebody at the customer service desk, that, look, I paid for five of these. I only got one of them. And what do you usually expect from the world? Well, you shouldn't have done that. You expect an argument. And when they say, you know, you're right. We made a mistake. You're, you're shocked by that. And if unbelievers can do that, how much more should a Christian genuinely demonstrate humility? Can I put it this way? This ought to be a daily thought. It ought to be a daily thought for you because you want your light to shine brightly. Your humility determines how bright it'll be. In Ephesians 4, 1 and 2, Paul gives as the very first indicator of walking worthy of your calling in Christ to live with all humility. That's the indicator. Humble yourself at every turn. Lower yourself at every turn. Matter less and less and less. One more way to be influential. Guard your tongue at a nuclear level. Guard your tongue at a nuclear level. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, that the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. There should not be a day when you relax on this. There should not be a day when you coast Every day should include the prayer from Psalm 141.3. Set a guard, O Yahweh, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. You'll be influential. Who are you influencing? How are you influencing them? One last part of the progression of a noteworthy Christian life. It's indisputable. It's influential. And one more, your Christian life is impactful. It's impactful. Now you've gone beyond giving evidence of your faith, which is indisputable, seeing your life influence those around you. Now your Christian life is flat out changing others. It's impactful. Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And now the progression reaches a peak. You have ascended to the top of Mount Noteworthy. And Jesus expects that your Christian life, which is unmixed with the world, will be so impactful that it'll literally change the eternal destinies of people around you. To glorify God based on the observation of your life, that's not just someone saying, well, it looks like God is active in his life. No, to glorify God is specific to someone repenting of their sins and coming to saving faith in Christ. Now listen, the Apostle Peter was there when Jesus taught this on the sermon, the sermon on the Mount. He was there. See if this doesn't sound familiar. From 1 Peter 2, 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul by keeping your conduct excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good works, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. If that sounds familiar, that is Peter's commentary on what Jesus is teaching here. What does it mean to glorify God? Revelation 15.4 describes nations bowing in submission to Christ as glorifying the Lord's name. Revelation 11.13 describes people coming to faith in Christ as the fact that they gave glory to God in heaven. And on the other side, of the coin. Revelation 16, 9 describes those who refused to submit to Christ. They did not repent and give him glory. Now, please don't mishear me. This is not the typical you can proclaim the gospel without ever speaking and your life will attract people to Christ. The gospel is defined in words. Words are necessary to proclaim the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. But it's your deeds and it's your works that open the doors for you to speak the gospel. That's what opens the door. And in fact, Jesus declared that genuine believers are fruitful. They, they do multiply themselves. I want to focus Our last few moments in Mark chapter 4, if you would turn there with me. And I want to just look for a a moment at the familiar ending to Jesus' parable of the soils. Jesus tells of four types of soil that receive the seed of the gospel. Three of the soils reject the gospel, but the fourth, the good soil, grows a plant that flourishes. Mark 4 verse 8 And other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they were yielding a crop and produced 
30, 60, and 100 fold. Now Jesus explains in verse 20, and those are the ones who were sown on the good soil, they who hear the word and accept it and are bearing fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. The plant here is not portrayed as having some sort of guilt trip. Oh no, I need to squeeze out some fruit here, squeeze out some grain. No, it just begins bearing fruit. It's just natural. I've most often heard this text taught in the context as a call to evangelism, and I appreciate that application, but that's way too narrow, and I think it tends to make us think in terms of a head count, with you wondering, I I can't possibly lead 100 people to faith in Christ. I just heard this. I'm 78 years old. I'm not going to be able to do that. Now, actually, you can, and you probably will. I'll tell you how in just a minute. The bearing of fruit should be put right alongside salt and light. It is the natural outgrowth of a, of a Christian life that is, is exuberantly reflective of Christ. And the fact is that if you are being salt, if you are being light, you will in all likelihood see people in heaven because of you and your faithfulness. And you might say, do you know me? I've said 11 words in my whole life. I, I don't knock on doors. I, I don't go to the park. I don't stand on a soapbox and preach the gospel. Let me see if I can convince you. There will be people in heaven that you never even knew came to faith in Christ, but in the sovereignty of God, the Lord will reveal to you that it was your prayer. You may have been bedridden for decades. And yet your prayers for the lost are heard in heaven and used as the catalyst to save. There will be children you influenced when you taught third and fourth grade Sunday school that 50 years from now, one of them is living a life of degradation and sin and he'll remember the kind words that you read from the lesson and they'll come to Christ in repentance long after you've even left this earth. Your husband Ladies, will be made more effective as you're faithful to serve him and his effectiveness will lead to helping the church and helping the church will lead to souls saved. Men, your wives will be made more effective as you encourage her to serve the Lord in every way she can and you come alongside one another. As you as families generously give to the local church, the funds spread the gospel. You never know what your own children will do if you simply pray for their salvation, what your grandchildren will do if you'll simply pray for their salvation, if you make certain they're taught the word of God. You don't know the impact of just you making a lifestyle of pursuing righteousness and being salt and being light that that I might not have much to offer in my mind. I, I don't speak well. I'm not that good at much, but I'll be salt and I'll be light. You have no idea the impact you have. Can I put it this way? Jesus is presenting yielding 30, 60, and 100 times yourself as the normal experience of the Christian. And you don't have to keep count. You don't have to keep score. Just be salt. Just be light. And I think you'll be amazed when you stand before the Lord. It's one of my most excited thoughts when I think about going to heaven is seeing the final score. I don't have to keep score. I just have to be salt. I just have to be light. The noteworthy Christian life is indisputable. It's influential. It's impactful. Now, the presence of Christians is about the only thing that makes this world bearable, isn't it? We are a purifying influence. We are an illuminating influence just by living our lives. God promised Noah that he would never again flood the world. He did not promise Noah that he wouldn't once again take all the true believers out of the world. The coming rapture of the church will be the removal of the salt and the light. And darkness will overwhelm the world. You see, your your part in the redemptive plan of God is that you're part of the grace of God to a dying world. You are part of his grace. Don't squander the opportunity to be part of God's kindness to a world that is going to be consumed with darkness. 
Jesus, the master teacher, said two things. I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. There it is. Our Father, we ask you to help us to be faithful. Help us not to be those that lose our saltiness, our effectiveness, our witness, our testimony. Help us to be those that are a shining beacon of light, reflecting through our lives toward the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that God is holy and man is unholy and separate from God, and yet through Christ that gap may be bridged if one will come by faith repenting of sin and asking for the mercy of forgiveness. I pray for us as a church body, Lord, that not a single member here would be smirched the name of Christ and make our church's reputation soiled. We pray we would be loyal to you. We pray we would be loyal to one another, that we would love one another, and that we would be, as it were, a salty and well-illumined church. We pray we would be faithful until Christ returns and that we would return all glory to him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.